What's going on folks, Nate here at Two Wheel Dyna Works, and as promised, we are back in the shop today, and I'm in the dyna room with our 24 MT-09. Since our last video on this bike, we've done a bunch of trackside testing, which was an absolute blast, by the way. I'll share that with you guys here second, because first, we're going to talk about some intake testing that we've done with a DNA drop-in air filter on this bike. So this is the stock air filter on a 2024 MT-09. And right away, just looking at it, you should be able to see there's a problem. There's all of this surface area here that is not filter material. That means that you're only using about maybe two thirds to three quarters of the actual surface area of the filter to allow air through it. Now the air filter the folks at DNA were nice to send over to us does not have that problem. Almost the entire filter is filter material. So what does that do in terms of performance? Well, let's show you. So to recap, this is what this bike made with the stock air filter in it and our ECU mapping in this same Leo Vince exhaust system last time we had it on the dyno. 115.6 horsepower and 65.8 foot-pounds of torque to the tire on pump gas. And this is what the bike makes in comparison now that it has the air filter in place. 116 and a half horse and 66.1 foot-pounds of torque. If I was actually any good at video editing, this would be where I'd insert the little cricket, cricket noise because that's not a big difference. You can see at the very top end there where this thing is really trying to breathe as much as it possibly can, it's a one and a half horsepower change. Almost exactly one and a half horsepower. And you can even see down there in the AFRs that it went from a 13.2, which is my target at wide open throttle on these bikes, to a 13.32. Now, that's a difference of 0.1 points of an AFR, 0.1. I have done no tuning on this since putting in the air filter. All I did was run the bike and get it nice and warm, make sure the tire pressure was the same as the previous runs and et cetera, et cetera, just to make them as like same as possible. 0.1 of an AFR is nearly non-existent. That's why it only made one to one and a half more horsepower than it did previously. Now, a lot of folks are probably confused. They're going, well, why is that? It's because this isn't actually that restrictive. It looks like it should be, but it isn't. Because the filter, like most modern Yamahas, is not the problem. The airbox design is. And this one is even smaller than the last generation, which was already a significant restriction, which is why that DNA stage two kit that completely replaces the top of the airbox lid works so damn well. So is an air filter an improvement in this bike? Yeah, sure. Do you need to even accommodate for it with proper ECU mapping? Absolutely not. 0.1 of an AFR is nothing. So if you wanna go ahead and swap one of these guys out, go for it. You'll at least get a cleanable filter, I guess, but for the cost of these things, for one to one and a half horsepower, eh. I'd replace it when it gets dirty. Now, just like last time, when we went out and did a bunch of trackside testing with this bike, I obviously rigged up our GoPro. I wanted to collect video for you guys and show you what we're doing. However, it was so hellaciously hot over the last, I don't know, seven or eight days here in the Northwest, and I feel really bad for the guys down in California, but the GoPro simply didn't survive. I couldn't get the video to stay uncorrupted for more than like three or four minutes, the batteries themselves were literally over temping about seven minutes on track and just shutting the thing off. So I wasn't really able to collect any good video to show you guys what we were doing. So unfortunately, I'll kind of have to explain it to you. By far, the single biggest improvement after, of course, an exhaust and EC flash on this bike that we've made to it to date was tweaking some of the chassis settings. And when I say chassis settings, I am not just talking about the suspension adjustments. I'll cover that in just a second. But there is huge room for improvement with going ahead and changing the geometry of the front and rear of this bike. And you can do it with the stock stuff on there, no problem. So we're gonna start at the back and work our way forward. Those of you that saw my previous video with some track testing on this bike will know that I had nothing but horrible things to say about the stock 180 rear battle axes that came on this bike. The 190 rear tire, we were using a Michelin Power 6 again, which is what we had on the shelf, has a so much better profile for an actual nice round tire to give you some handling characteristics that it's truly shocking that they even put that flat ass 180.55 on this thing from the factory. There was absolutely no sidewall left for me to work with, with the stock 180 rear tire. And the front sidewall still had chicken strips on it the size of my fucking thumb. And swapping out that rear 180 tire completely solved that problem. Again, it's less about the size and more about the profile. You need a nice round profile, not something that's as flat as a board, to actually be able to lean the thing over. Now. When you go ahead and put the slightly larger rear tire on there, effectively what you're doing is raising the rear of the bike. And all of a sudden, even just sitting on it, it feels like it's on the nose. And this bike was already a little squirrely under heavy braking, so having it even further on the nose did not help whatsoever. So after our very first session of just testing it the way it was, we went ahead and raised these forks dramatically. It is actually almost flush with the upper triple. There's about one millimeter of the fork showing. Before we did that, there was about five. 
Now, those of you doing the quick math are gonna go, but that's only four millimeters, that's not that much, that can't make a big difference, and you're completely wrong. Yes, four millimeters is not a lot as far as a measurement's concerned, or something that you can visualize conceptually, but in terms of chassis geometry and getting this thing to flatten out, it was hugely transformative. In fact, this bike was so much better with the 190 rear tire on it, and the forks picked up four millimeters, that I was able to break massively later into the short straightaway here that we have at the ridge, and I picked up three miles an hour because I was just braking further into the braking zone. And no, I wasn't just being a pussy the first time we took it out there. I was on the bottom of the forks then too. Even with as much preload compression dampening as we can give this thing, I am still at the very bottom of the fork travel. I'm just overweight for this bike. It's the way it is. But the braking and handling characteristics of picking up those front forks and having a 190 rear tire on there were just absolutely enormous. I cannot overstate how big of an improvement it was on this bike. Now I know there's going to be a bunch of people going, oh, but it's not the SP, it'll be better with the SP. Well, that's great. I don't have an SP here, so somebody, let me know. Do the same testing, I'd love to hear it. I'm 100% confident the Olin's on the SP model is going to be way better than this stuff. But I think people are sometimes shocked that it's just not that much better with the OEM equipped Olin's because it's not the same stuff you'd give you were to grab like a TTX shock or Nix 30 FKR carts putting these things in the aftermarket. Now, in a perfect world, if you could find a 180-60 rear tire, that would probably be a more appropriate choice for this, because you're not trying to get the rear tire to be wider. It does not need the additional grip. It makes under 120 horsepower. You don't need all that contact patch when you're coming off a corner. What you're looking for is to get the thing a little bit taller and have a nicer, rounder profile so you can actually handle the fucking thing through the corners. But a pair of these 190-55s and a matching front tire for the Michelin Power 6s is what I have stacks of here at the shop, so that's what I went ahead and put on the bike. And I will give credit where credit's due. If you go ahead and take a look at the tire wear on this thing, it is flawless. And I was running this at a much faster pace than I really should have been for the conditions out on the track this past weekend. It was 94 Fahrenheit in the fucking shade and track temps were over 150 degrees. And if you've ever done a track day at a true like A level or 300 group, whatever you want to call it, fast guy pace on DOTs in 150 degree track temps, it is fucking terrifying because it gets real greasy real fast. No DOT tire is really properly set up to handle 150 degree track temperatures and extreme brake pressure and coming out of a corner at wide open throttle on the edge of the tire. But these tires did shockingly well and I was routinely surprised session after session after session that I honestly didn't end up on my ass. In fact, I never even came close. I was not using the entire edge of the sidewall here. You can see that, yeah, I did not roll over the edge of this thing. It, it just wasn't going to happen. If I did, I probably would have ended up on my face. There just was not enough grip out there. But I got pretty darn close, and I was still doing lap times out there that would put me ahead of eh, half the guys and most of the fast groups at our local track organization, the Rid Motorsports Park. But more importantly, you can see that I have just about the same amount of tire remaining here on the front. So when I've got the same size wear mark here on the front, that's or not wear mark here on the front, excuse me, that's completely untouched, as I do here on the rear, that means from a grip perspective, the front and rear of this thing at lean angle are damn near perfectly balanced. Because again, you can go watch the previous video of the track testing we've done this, I had no rear sidewall left. I was way the fuck over that thing, and I was kind of losing the rear as I was coming out of the, some of the faster corners when it was leaned over and I was dragging the foot peg feelers all over the place, and the front tire just wasn't even close to the edge. So again, I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, but I can't understate how huge an improvement it was to get a better fucking rear tire on that thing, just a taller, better profile tire, and to raise those fucking front forks up. Now, I will talk about what I ended up doing for the suspension clickers on this thing and preload, but I don't know that it's gonna be that applicable to you because again, I'm over 240 pounds and six foot nine. Everybody all weekend long just laughed at how much this suspension was just wallowing under me because I'm just way oversprung for it. They do use a stiffer spring rate on the fourth gen MT-09 than they do on the third gen, so it feels better than the stock bikes did back in 21 to 23, but it's still way too soft for me. Because if you can see there, I have the preload literally maxed out on the absolute stiffest setting it will go on this shock. And on the front end of this thing, I am nearly bottomed in terms of preload on these front forks. I think I'm half a turn off the bottom. I still have about, eh, I think three clicks to go for compression, so three clicks out. And on rebound, I'm one click out. But again, I don't know that I would truly recommend doing that unless you have a bike exactly like ours, which is just the stock suspension base model 24MT09, and you're a guy that weighs like 240 pounds. 
Now, it'll also be really easy if you know how to set your own sag on one of these bikes to go ahead and determine where that really should be for you. Again, I'm so massively overweight for this bike and the stock suspension settings that I kind of just had to throw the whole kitchen sink at it in terms of preload. And I really had to slow the boinginess down of this thing and just kind of bury the rebound. But that's not the way you normally want to do it. That's sort of a band-aid on this bike for me because of how fucking big I am. And the last thing that I'm gonna cover because I think you guys will actually benefit from this hugely is the position of these bars. From the factory, they were way rolled down to about there. And again, I'm a big dude, but it was just too short. They were too low. They've lowered these bars from the 21 to 23 models. So the third gens had a taller bar than the fourth gens do. I don't know that I'd recommend necessarily swapping those bars, but you definitely wanna roll these things up. Going from just down here to up here where I've got them right now, which is about as high as you can go before they get kind of silly looking, again, made a massive difference in terms of just how much leverage I had to get this thing to roll through the corners at speed. Because the more mechanical leverage you have when it comes to bar input, the less actual force you have to put into the bars. So it just made cornering that much easier. Now, I'm sure there's gonna be a bunch of guys and some comments going, oh, that's suspension 101, why is he even covering this, blah, 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 blah. Well, yes, it is basic suspension and chassis setup, but there's a lot of people out there that know nothing about that whatsoever. To most folks, chassis and suspension setup is some kind of dark art. And I told you folks that I would share every modification we make to this bike and the improvements or detriments that it had to it. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. Because not all these changes for track use were honestly that great. There is one in particular that honestly kind of pisses me off, and I didn't even notice it till the end of the day, and it's this exhaust system. Right there, that folio that I said was so great and so quiet and made pretty good power for how not noisy it was in the dyno, because it fucking hits the swing arm if you're actually getting on it at the track. It's not a lot, but it's touching. And before a bunch of you just chime in and say, oh, it must just not be set up right now, it's, it's fucking installed right, guys. We've installed about a thousand exhaust systems here over the years. There's no way to move this thing around. You have one hard mount mounting bracket, and it's a straight bracket. And you've got the three headers that come down into a single collector and don't attach anywhere else until right there. So this just is the position this thing is in, period, end of story. And again, it's only a slight touching, but I thinking back on it, could feel where it was happening. It's usually when I had the front end buried and the rear end was actually lifting going into some of the heavier braking corners. And while again, that's some very minor rubbing, it still pisses me off because at the end of the day, none of these systems are all that cheap and it just shouldn't fucking hit anywhere. So where does all of that testing and feedback leave us with this bike? Well, not even close to done because there is still probably a dozen different exhaust systems we have to get installed on this bike and build custom ECU mapping for. I've got over half of them sitting out there in that room. We're gonna go ahead and start swapping them out ASAP. I've got a bunch of them stacked up. So we're gonna go through these rapid fire now here over the next few days and I'll share all the results with you guys. And of course, build custom mapping for each one of them because what we're here to do, we're here to provide the highest quality custom ECU flash that you can possibly get your hands on for these bikes and every intake and exhaust combination imaginable. And of course, our ECU flash for these bikes can be found on our website, twowheeldynaworks.com. They are on sale for $349.99. If you have any questions whatsoever about getting your bike properly tuned and dialed in, please do not hesitate to email us at support at twowheeldynaworks.com, and we will always be happy to help.